goal of today's talk is to try to explain some of the behavior that you're seeing in this movie up here, um, which is cells from the lungs of human patients that are either moving quite a bit collectively or not moving very much at all. And also simultaneously, we'll also try to explain rigidity and a lot of other biological structures, including um, extracellular matrix. And I'll get into that later. Before I go too far, I need to highlight the people who did the work. Um, in particular, uh, we have a, a really fantastic postdoc named Ojan Damavandi in my group who really spearheaded the work I'm discussing. Um, and he worked with Varda Haig, who's another postdoc shared jointly between a lot of folks, and then Chris Santangelo, who recently moved to Syracuse University. So I'll start by asking you, are you a solid or a fluid? Okay, if this was like an in-person talk, this would be very exciting because you'd be shouting out things like solid or fluid and would be, you, you'd like sort of give the side eye to somebody who answered differently than you, right? And the, uh, you know, good thing about it is, is that of course, if you yell out fluid, you, you're correct in a lot of ways because, you know, your body is made up largely of fluids. Um, and I would say that if you yelled out solid, that's the answer that I would also yell out. Because if you think about um, kicking a football or holding a baby or any of those things that you do with your corporal physical body, those are things that require you to support a shear stress. Um, and that is a solid like behavior, things like walking, many of the things we think animals do. But there are some interesting periods uh, and processes um, during things like development or disease, where instead of really your corporal body behaving like a solid, it really does start to behave like a fluid. Um, and by that, I mean that the cells in your body have to rearrange past one another and sort of move over long distances and generate big global changes to tissue shape um, during things like wound healing. Um, and also this one is one of my favorite examples, it's development. So first I'm gonna show you a movie, it's a canonical movie of zebrafish development. And the cells that are going to become the zebrafish are sitting here on top of a yolk. And they divide and divide and divide. And right about now they start to flow around the sides of the yolk um, to form the elongated body axis of the zebrafish. And uh, I'm gonna show you a second movie, which I think is gorgeous from Eva Maria Schatz Collins lab. And so this red stuff here is the nuclei of cells that are just at that stage where the cells are gonna start moving. It's called the shield states, where the cells are gonna start moving down the sides of the yolk. And so you're staining the nuclei here. So actually the cell bodies are nearly confluent. So um, imagine that these nuclei are in a tissue that is basically filling all of space with cell bodies. Okay, and so if I play this movie, you can see that the cell, so individual cells are really jostling around and changing neighbors. I would say very much as you would expect a fluid-like behavior in a material. Okay, and that's what allows you to come up with big adult zebrafish, which is cool. Okay. And so the other thing I wanted to say is that um, Oche Compass's lab and collaborators had this nice paper a few years ago now where they really carefully measured um, how cells were able to change neighbors or not. And also the, they did some force measurements so they could demonstrate that there was actually a big gradient in the tissue fluidity, the macroscopic behavior of the tissue from the top of the tail bud to the bottom of the tail bud. And they showed that that change in fluidity was actually very important for the process of elongation. You needed that. Um, you needed to be more fluid like down here and more solid like up here in order to facilitate the growth of that tail bud tissue. Um, and so I think that this is um, really, and, and there's actually been quite a few papers now over the past couple of years demonstrating that these type of fluid to solid transitions are important in a lot of different contexts in biology. Okay, so I don't just want to focus today on cellularized tissue where the cells are touching one another and filling all of space, um, because a lot of your body is also of course, composed of extracellular matrix, things like collagen networks um, that are disordered and they also transition 
from floppy to stiff. So they also have a rigidity transition. So I'm not gonna focus too much on the details, but this is some really nice work done experimentally by Heise Kondering's group, and then also um, on the theory side by Fred McIntosh's group um, that show that if you, the way that these collagen networks set up initially, they're very floppy. Okay, they, they're extremely floppy in situ. But as soon as you apply a strain, and so that is up along this axis, you can take something that's very floppy and sort of just by straining it, not too much, you get a much stiffer network. And so that's what I'm talking about from the floppy to rigid transition. And I, we would also simultaneously like to understand that. And of course, we'd like to understand the interplay between those two rigidity transitions, the one that happened in cellularized tissue, such as the spheroids um, embedded in extracellular matrix, because it's well known at this point that actually the stiffening of the extracellular matrix can promote uh, sort of a collective emergent behavior in the um, cell tissue, the collective, the spheroid to help the cells move and sort of, you know, metastasize if you think about it as a model for cancer. Okay. Um, oh, and yeah, we have some preliminary work on the archive about these sort of inner, I won't talk about it at all for the rest of the day, but if you're interested in that sort of thing, we do have a model now where we sort of have both the cellularized tissue and an ECM, and both of them have these fluid solid transitions, and we think about the interactions between those two. That was led by Amanda Parker. Okay. So now we're going to take this big sort of silly question and turn it into a real question. So instead of saying, how are, you know, are you a solid or a fluid? What we really mean here is how do mechanical interactions between cells, fibers, or cells and fibers dictate the emergent mechanics of a tissue? And I'd like to take a step back because I, I know that for many of you, this is a familiar concept, but emergent mechanics is surprising and we take it for granted. And so I, do, I like this quote by Phil Anderson quite a bit, you know, that you take a ruler and if you push one end of the ruler, the other end moves the right amount so that the ruler is rigid. But, but why is that? It is an emergent property that is not contained in any simple law of physics, although it is a consequence of that. And so we're gonna be talking about that for the rest of today. Okay. And the other point that I want to make is though, you know, is that in general, I mean, you might <laughs> worry about the rest of this talk because of course, individual cells and individual collagen fibers are already extremely, extremely complicated objects, right? And so um, I want to highlight here and it maybe, you know, makes the rest of my talk seem terrible, but that understanding emergent mechanics is difficult even when the underlying objects are incredibly simple. Okay. So my favorite example here is sand, right? And so the idea is if you take a pile of sand and they happen to be truly elastic spheres. So this pile of sand is just a bunch of uh, actually elastic disks. So you know everything about the behavior of each individual disk um, and they're birefringent. So you can see the force chains that set up inside this pile of elastic disks. The point is, is that it's very difficult to predict this emergent complicated behavior, even though the underlying constituents are trivial, right? Okay, of course, and we're all aware of this in general, because like most of us, I assume, have been to a beach, although maybe not recently, but you know, so if you go to a beach, of course, you're used to being able to walk along the sand. And the sand supports your weight, which means it's a solid, right? Okay, but then of course, if you pick it up, especially if you're not in the wet part that's cohesive right near the ocean, but you're a little further away from the ocean and you pick it up, it sifts through your fingers and the way it behaves is very, very much like the fluid, very much. Okay, and so you can say, well, clearly I haven't really changed very much about the properties of that sand between when it behaved like a solid under my feet and when I picked it up, maybe, maybe it's a little less dense, but you know, very similar in structure. Um, okay, there's many other examples. Sand is my favorite, but there's lots of examples of these sort of difficult to predict emergent behaviors. But the silver lining, of course, we all know as mathematicians and physical scientists, is that when you look at statistics over large numbers, sometimes you can generate or identify universal features. And why that's really good, especially if you're interested in biology, 
is that those universal features may not be too dependent on the details of the model. It might be that a huge number of sort of small scale models for say cells or fibers give rise to the same universal behavior at the scale of a tissue. Um, and that's what I'm going to try to articulate to you today that saves us <laughs> in the case of trying to predict rigidity in tissues. Okay, so I know some of you are um, more uh, focused on molecular mechanisms in your work. And I also wanna highlight that I think that even though I'm focused today on very different things, um, that this type of analysis I'm about to present is actually really important for those of you who are interested in molecular mechanisms. Because I think the question that it allows us to answer is which type of mechanical and morphological features of tissues require specific molecular programming, right? We'd like to know that so we can mess with those molecules and then see different behavior at the scale of tissues. And if, if we can understand first which features emerge sort of for free and generically from interactions between tissues with very little importance on the details of the molecules, then it's much easier to pinpoint those processes for which you do need specific molecular mechanisms. All right, good. Okay, so now I'm gonna focus <laughs> on a question that's really been driving me crazy for about the past five years. Um, so we discovered that these models and tissues have a rigidity transition in them about five years ago. And ever since then, I have been really upset that I could not articulate what is the mechanism, the underlying physical mechanism that gives rise <laughs> to this rigidity. And so that's going to be the focus of my talk today. So, and I'm going to sort of be a little a little grandiose, I'm sorry. But I think the answer is that biological tissues are mechanical metamaterials. And I'm gonna make that statement really precise throughout this talk. And I'm gonna explain what I mean by mechanical metamaterial too, so don't worry. Um, they acquire rigidity. What, what do I mean by this? I mean that they acquire rigidity differently from standard examples that we're used to, such as molecular um, materials like crystals and glasses or granular materials. They're, they acquire rigidity via a different mechanism. And actually it required, in order to understand this, it required us to develop a new theory of rigidity. And this is the archive paper that will show up, hopefully um, we're gonna submit it today to the archive and it'll show up in a couple of days. So I don't have an archive number, but it will be coming. Okay, so let me first say what our canonical understanding of how things rigidify. And I'll use granular materials because I think it's the very simplest way to explain it. So of course, if you ever took a physics or chemistry class, you know that there's an equation of state for materials. And if you want to make something a solid, what do you do? You either stick it in a freezer <laughs> so that it becomes cold or you put, compress it. You put a lot of pressure on the material. Those are the two ways we know to make a system rigid. Okay, and so I wanna focus on that pressure piece in particular, because I think that will help us gain a lot of tuition, intuition. So our intuition is that materials become solid-like as we apply a pressure or as they get crowded. And very specifically, I mean, as the packing fraction or the number density increases for those materials. And why is that? Why is that our intuition? Okay, well, in the simple model of disordered spheres, at zero temperature, which is called particulate jamming. So think um, a jar of squishy marbles, okay? Jar of squishy marbles is what you should have in your head. Okay, how do I decide when that thing becomes rigid? Well, I if I have um, NP particles, so, uh, so NP is the number of squishy marbles, okay? And I'm living in D dimension. So for marbles, that's three dimensions, right? Because I can move up, down, left, right, front, back, right? So there are NP times D degrees of freedom. And I'll call that capital N, right? So that's the number of ways all of those marbles can move. If I get more crowded, then these particles start to touch one another. And every time they develop a contact, that generates a constraint, right? On those pair of particles, okay? And so if each particle has Z neighbors, so that's what that little Z is, Okay, then the total number of constraints in the system, well, it's just the number of particles times the number of contacts each particle has. Well, and I have to divide by two because each one of those contacts is shared by two particles. 
right? So that is NP times Z divided by two number of constraints in the system. Cool? Okay. So then in mean field, you expect rigidity to occur precisely when those two quantities are equal, when the number of degrees of freedom equals the number of constraints. And then you do one line of algebra and you see that you expect this to happen when the number of contacts per particle, this little z, is equal to two times the number of dimensions. Okay, so in 3D, that would be six. Okay, then it becomes obvious at low densities, I have less than that critical number of contacts and the system is under constrained and therefore floppy. And at high densities, I go just above that critical number of contacts and the system is over constrained and therefore rigid. And this critical point is where it becomes rigid. Okay, and it actually is a real critical point. Okay, so quite surprisingly, I would say this mean field calculation works for jamming. It works perfectly for jamming of particles. And it also gives rise to a whole bunch of cool stuff that I won't talk about, like topologically protected excitations and things and materials. Okay, good. So um, because I'm going to sort of give you towards the end of this talk, like a rigidity manifesto that we've developed, I'm going to give you a little bit more details first about a little bit clearer picture of how this constraint counting works, because there are some subtleties. So this is a bar um, uh, uh, framework, which means that there's these hinges, these orange dots, and those are the degree of freedom, and they're connected by bars, which are the constraints. And so if I want to do constraint counting a little bit more carefully, then I can say, well, this system in 2D has eight degrees of freedom, okay, and it has four constraints clearly. Then there are three trivial rigid body rotations or ro translations. So two translations and one rotation. So that's three rigid body motions. And so therefore I expect there to be one non-trivial floppy mode. And indeed there is, I've drawn a picture of what that floppy mode is. Okay, and then I can fix it. If I said, oh, I want this structure to be rigid, everyone can see that I can just add one more constraint to the system and I can get rid of all of the floppy modes in this system. Great. But there's a subtlety here, which is that if I put two of those frameworks together like this, I would expect this system to be rigid as well. And it is, and I can do constraint counting that way. But if I was stupid and put one of this bar, instead of putting it here, if I put a redundant bar over here, then you can see that actually I would have allowed there still to be a floppy mode in my system. Okay, and so what this tells you is there's a subtlety here that it's not just measuring whether the number of degrees of freedom equals the number of constraints, right? There's also these things called states of self-stress, which corresponds to a set of forces on my system that allow all of the points to remain invariant. So you can see that I can put, when I put these two bars here, I introduce sort of a set of forces, right, that can actually still allow the system to maintain mechanical equilibrium. And this is called a state of self-stress. And it turns out, and this was some work by Kaladine quite a long time ago, that this is the extra thing I have to add to constraint counting to get it work more generically, is I also have to count these states of self-stress. Okay, cool, good. Okay, so interestingly, <laughs> even with that extension where you really pay attention to the states of self-stress, this constraint counting does not explain rigidity in many under constrained systems. Okay, and so here's some examples. Okay, so one example is uh, a guitar string. And for simplicity here, I'm going to approximate a guitar string as a series of M segments, each with the rest length, this little L nut. Okay, so I have all of these segments and each one of them is a spring with the rest length. Okay, and the game that I'm playing is I'm allowed to change the uh, overall ends of where that guitar string is, just like on a real guitar where I'm tuning it, right? Because when I tune a guitar, I'm just stretching the length between the ends of the string, right? So the interesting thing is, is that if I choose to hold the two ends of my string close enough together so that all of the springs basically are happy so they can all be at their wanted to be rest length, then this system is floppy. You know, it's basically like an untensed guitar string, okay? Then there's a critical length, 
which is exactly when the length of all the segments are exactly at their preferred rest length, where the system is becomes rigid. Okay. And then if I continue to stretch the system, it becomes more and more stiff. And that's when you pluck it and you hear different sounds on the guitar string. Okay. So the rigidity transition occurs at the special L naught star, I'll call it. So it's when the length between the ends of the string is exactly equal to the sum of all the rest lengths of the segments. Okay. And I'm basically not changing the topology of this network. It's just a one dimensional chain. What I'm doing is tuning a continuous parameter, which is the rest length of the spring. And all of a sudden I get a rigid system. Okay. And just because I'm going to be going back and forth between these two things, I want to point out that I talked about changing the sort of size of where the endpoints were, this global L, which is the sort of how far apart the endpoints were for the string. But equally well, it's totally equivalent to talk about changing the rest lengths and fixing capital L, right? Those two things are exactly equivalent. I can either change the rest lengths of the springs or change L that's doing the same thing. Good. Okay, so I just gave you a guitar string. The next example I want to give you uh, um, is a mechanical metamaterial. So, and I love origami, so I'll focus on origami. Um, and the point I want to make is that many origami structures actually become rigid under folding due to essentially exactly the same mechanism that's operating in the guitar string. And I will talk about it later, but I just wanna give you first this idea that mechanical metamaterials are another type of material that has this property quite often. And this is a um, Miraori fold pattern. And I'm actually gonna show you a quick little movie by Itai Cohen to show you why mechanical metamaterials are so cool. Okay, so this is Itai. I think you should be able to hear him. If uh, the particular paper that we wrote in science deals with uh, the Mira Ora uh, fold. Uh, this uh, is basically a, a series of parallelograms um, that, uh, when folded into a sheet of paper, give that paper some mechanical properties uh, that are determined by the fold patterns that we put in to the paper itself. The nice thing about this uh, strategy for giving materials uh, mechanical properties is that by changing the fold patterns, for example, I can give the paper a different effective stiffness. I can also introduce new novel mechanical properties. For example, um, if I take a banana and I just squish it in my hand, that banana is going to squirt out the other ends. But this particular pattern, if I expand it in one direction, expands in the other direction. And if I contract it, it contracts in the other direction. Okay. So the point that I wanted to make here, right, is, is mechanical metamaterials are objects that have mechanical properties that are generated by sort of the topology of the network of folds or sort of these sort of mesoscale properties. And they don't depend on the underlying mechanics of the material, um, which is the piece of paper. Right. So this the idea here is, is that by sort of designing sort of specialized like network topologies, you can generate materials that have pro rigidity properties that are totally different from the ones you would expect from the underlying material or these sort of um, granular material um, mean field type of arguments about rigidity. Is that cool? Does that make sense? Is that, OK. Great. It's so hard on Zoom. I don't know if any of you are interested or even uh, the particular... understanding what I'm saying, but hopefully it's not too boring. Uh, I know I'm competing with the uh, internet and stuff. Okay. So a diverse set of biological tissue is also seem to do this, right? So for those of you who are interested in biology, I promise I'm getting to the point. Okay. So this is the data on fiber networks, such as collagen. And the idea is, as I told you, is that here's the strain. So you take a chunk of this like extracellular matrix like material. And if you sort of don't strain it at all and you measure the shear modulus, it's basically zero. It's exceedingly soft and floppy. And then there's at this critical strain, and that's this black line here. All of a sudden, you 
get this sort of situation where this thing stiffens by orders of magnitude. So notice that this is a log scale and these things have this critical strain at which they stiffen. So hopefully this reminds you a lot of that guitar string. And actually I think this is essentially like the 2D version of the guitar string, right? So there's this critical strain at which the system realizes that, oh, my springs are no longer happy and it becomes rigid. Okay, and I'll talk more about that. But I also want to highlight that there's sort of a standard spring network model, which basically has the uh, a quadratic term and the difference between the length of a individual spring and its rest length, and it's quadratic in the sum over all of those. Okay. And confluent tissues actually behave very similarly. Um, okay, and instead of it being the rest length of the spring now that's tuning their behavior, it's what we call a target cell shape. And I'll talk more about what that is in a moment. For now, I just want you to think about it as a tuning parameter. And so if the cell shape is less than some critical value in 2D, that critical value turns out to be about 3.8, then the cells do not rearrange or change neighbors. So this is the solid-like regime of the model. And if you go above this critical shape, then the cells rearrange quite a bit and behave like a fluid, okay, floppy. Okay. And actually over the past five years or so, we've done a huge amount of work to try to take this idea and made it, make it quantitatively predictive in real systems. So this is a paper that just came out last year where we worked with Karen Keisha's group, who's an expert on fruit fly development. And we looked at body axis elongation in the fruit fly. And our model makes a prediction that if you look at a cell shape in a way I'll explain in a second. Again, I don't want you to get lost in the details right now, but you can measure a cell shape. So all you have to do is take a snapshot of your fruit fly body and you segment the cell shapes. And then if you measure these two things, we tell you how to measure, which is the cell shape and the cell alignment. And again, these are numerical things that are precise. We make this prediction of this black line with no fit parameter, like zero fit parameter. So this is a quantitative prediction, this black line with zero fit parameters. And we say, if you're on this side of the line, you should be solid like. And if you're on this side of the line, that the cell should rearrange rapidly and be fluid like. And then we, we measured how fast cells rearrange in many embryos. And so here is a trajectory for a single embryo as a function of time. And the blue colors you can see are basically the cells aren't rearranging at all. And the orange colors are that the cells are rearranging extremely rapidly. So as you can see, as a function of developmental time, the system starts out in the solid-like phase and then quite remarkably, right when it crosses this critical point, the cells start to rearrange very rapidly. And then this is looking at lots and lots of different embryos. So you can see that we sort of fill in the phase space. And, and I, I have to say, when I saw this, I was just so excited because again, this means that quantitatively with no fit parameters, you can take a snapshot of the body axis of one of these embryos and predict if the cells are going to rearrange or not, right? Which is pretty cool. Okay. And so I'm going to tell you just briefly about the model that allows us to make these types of predictions. It's called a vertex model and it's ridiculously stupid. <laughs> okay. It's one of these models that's very simple, but it works in the way that I just told you, like this prediction is right um, for these types of tissues. And so the simple model must be capturing something. Um, and the idea is, is that, okay, there's a lot of biology I'm not going to talk about in this, you know, in this talk, because I want to tell you about rigidity. But you, one way of thinking about this set of equations is that if you have an epithelial monolayer, so a layer, a single layer of cells, and it's confluent, which means there's no gaps or overlaps between the cells. If you sort of take a bird's eye view of that monolayer, so it's a monolayer and you sort of look at the top of it then the cells tend to look like cobblestones is how biologists refer to it in a good epithelial layer. And they have a characteristic, if it's the same cell type, a characteristic cross-sectional area. And I'll call that A here in this formula and a cross-sectional perimeter P. 
Okay, and then what these equations say to, a, to an audience that does physical science and mathematics stuff, it just says, well, there's a preferred perimeter that cells like to have, and there's a quadratic penalty for going away from that preferred perimeter, and there's a preferred area that cells like to have, and there's a quadratic penalty. And of course, we all know quadratic is the lowest Taylor expansion allowed. So there could be higher order terms and there probably are, but this is the simplest thing you can write down. Um, and, you know, there's actually a lot of biology explaining where all these terms come from, including like adhesion mo mo molecules and cortical actomycin and incompressibility. But again, I'm not going to focus on that for this talk. I'm happy to like talk to you ad nauseum about it after the talk. Okay, but then you can non-dimensionalize this equation. And what you see, it's uh, really cool. Um, there's a dimensionless parameter that pops out. And the most important one is this P0, I'll call it. And it's what I meant by the shape of the cell. It's the target perimeter. So it's the perimeter that cells want to have divided by the square root of the target area. So it's just a dimensionless parameter. It's the one, right? It turns out that this other one is not quite so important. Um, but this one is really important for the rigidity transition. Great. Okay. So <laughs> um, I don't know if this audience ever watched Terminator 2 <laughs> as a kid or, uh, or whatnot, but I want to emphasize that this is sort of exactly the sort of thing that if you wanted to be evil and design a Terminator 2, or if you wanted to be nice and design some material that had nice properties that could sort of use these ideas that happen in biology of where when you need to, you can flow like a fluid. And then at important times, you rigidify into a solid so you can form a body and support shear stresses. This is exactly the type of bio-inspired material you'd like to be able to design. So you'd like to be able to use these principles to design things that are hopefully less evil than Terminator 2 maybe without the, that memory chip that makes him evil, right? But that's the idea. Okay, so uh, now I'm going, to, now we're to the math part. So this is, I call it our rigidity manifesto. <laughs> and again, this is the work by these folks. Um, and we want to basically generically describe this type of rigidity in some coherent way, okay? How do we go beyond constraint counting? Because constraint counting clearly doesn't work. Okay, so there is a beautiful, correct old answer to this uh, question. Um, and it's sort of mostly mainly focused on things called tensegrity structures or bar hinge frameworks, um, where you focus on the geometry of a structure. So what do I mean by that? I mean that you care, there's all these bars and hinges. And so you can think about those bars and hinges or cables as constraints. And you ask, when are the constraints satisfied? And that's a geometry problem, right? Because if the length of each bar is equal to its rest length, then the constraints are satisfied, right? That's a purely geometry problem. Cool. And I, I should say this paper by Connolly and Whiteley is just lovely and really cool. Okay, and they define in that paper structural rigidity. So I'm going to call structural rigidity from now on means that there is no non-trivial global motion that preserves those constraints, those bars. Okay. Okay. So if there's no motion that preserves those bars, we're going to call that thing structurally rigid. That makes sense. But <laughs> unfortunately, even for a simple planar graph, figuring out whether that planar graph is structurally rigid is an NP hard problem. Oh my gosh. Right. I think that's cool and surprising. Okay. So what mathematicians and structural engineers have done is come up with simpler tests for rigidity or proxies that work most of the time. And one of those proxies is called first order rigidity, which just means there's no non-trivial global motion that preserves the constraints to first order in perturbations to the constraints. That makes sense, right? That's an obvious thing to do as a mathematician. Okay, and then second order rigidity is the next obvious thing, right? Okay, if you don't do it to first order, you do it to second order, okay? And these are work actually amazingly well a lot of the time. It turns out that first order rigidity and second order rigidity work really well in most cases to predict structural rigidity and they're not NP hard. Okay, so, you know, okay, just to, I know I said this already, but I'm gonna say it again, because it's so important. For structural engineers, a floppy system is one you can push on without changing the constraints. It's a really obvious definition, but 
physical materials always have an energy functional. And almost always, in a lot of cases, you can reduce them to being quadratic functionals of some bond or constraint. So this is our model for cells that I told you about. This is the vertex model. There's a quadratic energy penalty in this perimeter constraint, and there's a quadratic penalty in the area constraint. Okay, cool. And then for spring networks, there's also, well, actually, even for fiber networks, there's a quadratic penalty in the rest length of, or sort of the length of each individual spring in the spring networks. And if they're fibers, you also put in this quadratic penalty in the angle, right, of the system. So I'm just emphasizing here that physical materials have an energy functional, and that energy functional quite often is quadratic in the constraint in the constraints to first, you know, I mean, there's higher order terms, but the first order terms are quadratic. Okay. So if you care about the physical systems, you care, it's floppy if you can push on it without changing the energy, right? That's the obvious definition for actual physical systems. Okay. The point of this talk is that that means there may be motions that don't preserve the constraints, but preserve the energy. Isn't that neat? Okay, somehow this is not, as far as we can tell, been in the literature, okay? So that's why you need a manifest, rigidity manifesto. Okay, so again, um, if you think about sort of constraints, um, you, could, you, you could move, the, imagine designing or moving a system in such a way that, okay, the, each individual constraint isn't preserved, but because there's positive and negative terms, you can actually move the system at constant energy. And to a physicist or to somebody that cares about a biological system, that should still be floppy. <laughs> if you can move at constant energy, that's floppy, okay? But you could be changing the constraints, but changing them in a way such that they compensate for one another. Okay, so we want to know, when does this happen, okay? And can we understand, therefore, the mechanisms driving this type of rigidity? And in fact, because that first order rigidity works so well and the second order rigidity works so well, the question we're really going to be asking is, can we figure out, so we've added this new energetic rigidity to our list of possible rigidities, okay? And we're basically asking, can we show when first order rigidity implies energetic rigidity or second order rigidity? When, when can we know is the question we're asking, okay? So um, there's, uh, I'm not gonna go through this. This is a bunch of math. And actually, because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to say that we can do a bunch of math. So, oh, I do wanna say this though. We have to assume, because now we have an energy functional, which we're making primary, we assume that the system, a physical system of interest, the initial condition is a local minimum of the energy. Okay, and that is something that is not generically assumed in tense integrity structures and other systems. And so that allows us to look at perturbations around the local energy minimum. Okay, and we do a lot of math, we perturb the system, and we ask, how does the energy change of the system? And our condition for floppiness is that the energy doesn't change to first or second order, for example. Okay. So there's some stuff. Okay, for those of you who know about Hessians or dynamical matrices, it turns out that the Hessian is the thing that really tells you about whether the energy changes to second order. And importantly, we can write the Hessian as a sum of two terms. One term is basically a function of what's called the rigidity matrix, if there's folks in the audience who have done rigidity theory. So this is the rigidity matrix, Gramian term. So it's a Gramian of the rigidity matrix. This R is the rigidity matrix. And there's something which we'll call the pre-stress matrix. Okay. And so um, again, I'm not going to go through all of the details of this um, because I don't think it's uh, you know, in a, in a talk like this, it's too much details anyway. Um, but the important thing to note is this part of the Hessian, this pre, the reason we break it up this way is this pre-stress matrix is only non-zero if the system is pre-stressed, which means the constraints are not satisfied at that local minimum of the energy. So the point here is that physical systems can find themselves at local minimum of the energy where the energy is not zero, which means that the constraints are not satisfied. They're all unhappy. And then the system has this pre-stress. Okay, that's the point. 
All right. And then we can do some math and come up with what, you know, floppiness, energetic floppiness means in terms of these matrices. I'm not going to go into the math. Okay. But I am going to talk about, no, because now the question is, is does first order rigidity imply energetic rigidity all the time, some of the time? When? Okay, so I want to remind you of first order rigidity using the language that I've now introduced. So a first order zero mode is a set of displacements that preserve constraints to first order. And that means it's in the right null space of the rigidity matrix. So I'm just going to write an equation that looks like this. These zero modes are in the right null space of the rigidity matrix. That's why the rigidity matrix is such a nice object and everyone talks about it, okay? If there are no first order zero modes, then we call the system first order rigid. Also a state of self stress is a set of the bonds on the network that don't result in any displacements. So that's actually in the left null space of the rigidity matrix, okay? So this is a nice, rigidity matrices are very nice for this reason, okay? And that's actually what gives rise to the maxwell calodine constraint counting theorem we talked about earlier is that R is a matrix and therefore it obeys a rank nullity theorem. And so this equation is just the rank nullity theorem for this rigidity matrix. Okay, cool. Okay, so, but, okay, so we have these things that don't obey that constraint counting. Okay, and then you need to go to second order. <laughs> and then I'm gonna go through all of the math of going to second order, okay? But we can show that, um, that a second order zero mode it importantly involves a state of self-stress sitting here in, a, in an equation like this. So second order rigid systems um, have sort of this uh, important feature that the zero, the second order zero modes are deeply related to states of self-stress. Again, I'm not trying to, I'm just giving you sort of some sketch of these ideas. I'm not expecting you to go through all of this math. Um, okay. The important thing is, is that second order rigidity is not an NP hard problem. So this is, you have to solve an equation. Uh, it's actually a, a quadratic and a poly, uh, polynomial equation. Um, and you have to find the roots of a polynomial to solve that. So that's P hard, not NP hard. So you can do that using like Mathematica, for example. Okay. So what is the relationship then between energetic rigidity, first order and second order rigidity? And here's the answer. <laughs> so I'm not telling you all of the math that went into determining this. Okay. But so the question again is, is when do these simpler proxies that we can solve in quickly, relatively quickly, imply energetic rigidity? Okay. And the answer is in some cases, first order rigidity implies energetic rigidity. And this is a case you go through this tree. This is like the number of states of self-stress. And this is the spectrum of the pre-stress matrix, the eigenvalue spectrum of the pre-stress matrix, okay? So things you can figure out. Um, and you can predict whether a system is, whether you can use one of these simpler tests to predict energetic rigidity. So this particular branch correspond to that, those jammed spheres. And so this is why Maxwell constraint counting works for jammed spheres is because of this branch. Okay, it turns out that spring networks and vertex models um, without an area term, so just the vertex models with a perimeter term, we can show second order rigidity implies energetic rigidity. So that's really cool. That means that it's second order perturbations in the constraints that are generating rigidity in fiber networks, extracellular matrix models, and vertex models. That's really cool. Okay. And then there are some things, some systems, where actually we can't prove anything at all yet. Um, and that's where the pre-stress matrix has negative eigenvalues. And there's some interesting cases. So there's also some possibilities that these first order and second order rigidities do not imply energetic rigidity. And so that's open. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about this slide. If you know a lot about the rigidity literature in like tensegrity structures and stuff, we have basically connected all of the things I'm talking about to all of the things that uh, structural engineers and mathematicians talk about. But um, the important thing I want to say about this thing is, is that energetic rigidity and structural rigidity are not one-to-one. -one. In fact, there do exist motions that don't preserve the constraints, but preserve the energy in some systems. That is definitely a possibility. Okay. Um, I have like two minutes left. 
So I'm just going to show you some movies um, because I want to, I basically want to tell you that we've done a whole bunch of math to show how this stuff I just worked through this rigidity manifesto actually works in examples that I care about. So vertex models and spring network models, we can write all of this out formally and do analytic calculations for those things. But I could just show you movies of what happens it, when in these systems, when they go, go through one of these rigidity transitions. So if I have a spring network, and it is um, below this critical strain threshold. It looks something like this, and all of the springs are relaxed, and the system has basically zero shear modulus. There's no tension in the system. And then when I go across the rigidity transition, I start to get tensions in my network. And I can even show you a movie of what, oh, I thought the movie would play. Let's see if I can make it play. So all of a sudden you stretch and pop. Did you see how all of a sudden, there's 10, so let me play that again. So there's a network, a spring network that isn't tense and I'm pulling on it very slowly. And there's a particular critical point at which the second order constraints force tension in the system. And all of a sudden the tension pops in, right? It is really the second order constraints that are doing this in a way we can prove by looking at the spectrum of the eigenvalues of the system and stuff. But at the end of a talk, I'm just going to show you some pretty pictures. So the same thing happens in vertex models. So again, this is this tuning parameter there, where if I have a cell shape, sort of this cell shape is more elongated so that the cells have a large perimeter to area ratio, then the system is floppy and I have no shear modulus. And then, um, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way there. And then as soon as I cross this threshold of a particular shape, so the cells are getting more rounded, so they have smaller perimeters relative to their area. So they go from looking like this to looking like this. And there's a critical point in that shape at which the whole thing rigidifies. And again, it rigidifies due to second order rigidity, due to the second order um, perturbations um, in the constraints. Um, and you can look at a movie. So if you're on the floppy side and you just put a teeny tiny fluctuation on top of it, all of the cells move around. And if you're in the solid-like phase, the cells jiggle around, but they don't change neighbors. Okay, so you can see solid-like here, fluid-like here. And the only thing, this is the same amount of fluctuations added to the system. The only thing I changed is I've changed the shape of the cells just above this critical threshold. So it went from looking like this to this. And you see this big change in the behavior of the system. Again, it's second order rigidity. Okay, so in summary, rigidity in many standard materials is described by first order rigidity. That's that constraint counting, that maxwell caladine constraint counting. That's what we're used to for jam spheres and glasses and all sorts of stuff. Okay, rigidity in biological tissues, either cellularized tissues or extracellular matrix, is described by energetic rigidity. And in actually the two cases we care most about that I introduced both ECM and biological tissues, second order rigidity works <laughs> to predict their rigidity. So that's pretty cool. It's second order rigidity that's generating that, okay? Metamaterials rigidified by higher order rigidity are really nice for design because they do not require changing the topology of the network. Right, So you don't have to engineer in a change to the topology of the network. You just have to take a tuning parameter and move it a teeny tiny bit right, in order to cross this rigidity transition. So it's a really nice design principle for lots of things. And instead, in all of these systems, metamaterials and biological tissues, so actually biological tissues are metamaterials in this sense, the onset of rigidity occurs precisely when there's a state of self-stress that pops in, you know, due to very small changes in parameters, such as the target spring rest length or the cell shape or the strain in the system. Okay, and so I'm not gonna talk about the biology experiments at all, except to flash up a couple of things saying that once you do this type of stuff, there's a lot of things you can predict in experiments. <laughs> and for this talk, I'm not gonna tell you all of the things, but it's, it's really helpful. Okay, and so the outlook is, you know, biological tissues or metamaterials rigidified by terms beyond first order, 
could be an exciting design principle for bio-inspired materials. And of course, it starts to make you wonder, what is the space of designs? What does biology take advantage of? Okay, I'm not gonna show the Terminator movie again, sorry. <laughs> I'll leave you with uh, the, uh, you know, the people who did the work and thanks for your attention. Oh, audibly clapping. I'm afraid you don't get a clap like you do in person, but that was really excellent talk. So uh, thank you. Is there any questions? So far, if you, uh, the chat, um, the only comment we had during the talk was that someone, uh, Andrew said he loves Terminator 2. And I <laughs> second that. Um, yeah, um, there's no, oh, go on, Chris. Uh, I was just going to, I might have missed something at the time, but um when you were showing the uh, the phase space of um, you had the the shape and the alignment on the two axes and the the sort of fluid to solid transition, and you showed a, a time course for an embryo through that state space. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if there's anything that occurs in terms of the behavior of the embryo at the point where it crosses that transition. Yeah, that's a really good, that's a, a great question. And I, you didn't miss it because I didn't say anything about it. Um, but uh, there's, there's a couple of things that happen that um, biologists are trying to tease apart sort of throughout this. So there's two main processes that folks think are driving this body axis elongation biologically. One is there's a planar cell polarity pathway that's developing in the embryo that tends to sort of have um, long um, sort of higher tension cables oriented vertically and that and lower tension cables ho oriented horizontally, roughly speaking, that helps to elongate this tissue. Um, and simultaneously, there's also processes sort of external to this tissue, like ventral furrow formation and things happening in the fruit fly that are generating external stresses and strains, global external stresses and strains on the tissue. And so uh, it's unclear at the moment, like which of those two processes is sort of, they're probably both, it's biology. So probably both are working in concert to generate this elongation. The interesting thing is this particular critical point. Um, it doesn't sort of happen at a sort of, mm, like it's not when the obviously like the planar cell polarity turns on or something that actually happens. So can I, can you see my cursor? So yeah. that actually happens sort of out here is when those um, processes sort of really start to get going, the planar cell polarity and it's sort of those processes are what drive it back this way. I think if, if that makes sense. Right. So I, I, I would say that, you know, if I was allowed to conjecture, what I would say is our data is consistent with the idea that a additional thing that's happening in this tissue is those planar cell polarity pathways and associated signaling may be changing the preferred cell shape in such a way that, the, because like, it's not just enough to compress cells. <laughs> um, if you just stretch cells, if they're solid-like, they're not gonna change neighbors. And therefore you'll get an elastic-like response of the tissue, but you won't get a global, like permanently deformed tissue. And so if you really want a permanently deformed tissue, you, you know, conjecturing, the cells may be actually here changing their preferred cell shape in such a way that you cross this rigidity transition. So they go from just smooshing, <laughs> that's a technical term, to rearranging, right? To actually changing neighbors. And that allows a permanent deformation. So it's sort of suggestive that it would be fun to go back in and sort of ask, you know, is that an important component of like allowing permanent deformation is really programming in this change but there's not sort of specific evidence for that, but it's now a question one could ask. Is like, because it's not just enough to smoosh the tissue, you have to somehow tell the tissue, oh, I don't want this to be an elastic response. I want it to be a plastic or fluid-like response to sort of freeze in that deformation and not get a spring-like, you know, re return. And there are some mutants that actually do that spring-like thing. So there's some mutants where you can really mess with this and then they don't cross that, that fluidity transition and therefore they don't elongate. Yeah, it's, it's in, I just think the, the timing of it's really interesting because, I mean, I have limited experience with the Drosophila embryos, but 
um, from what I've seen in the past, you do get these sort of points where suddenly everything starts, it goes from a sort of point of uh, being relatively static to suddenly things are changing very quickly, um, especially in the furrow formation. Um, yeah. And, and, yeah, I will, and I will say the crossing here happens. So this like crossing this black line here does happen at a pretty consistent developmental time. It's clearly kind of programmed in. that They want to cross this transition kind of at the same point in development. You know, yeah, that's very interesting. Thanks. Sure. Great. So, Don had a uh, question. Oh, cool. Sorry, I had some difficulties there, but I'm back. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Carl. Thanks, Igor. Uh, so, yeah. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for a great talk. That was that was really interesting. Um, so it's interesting you're talking about um, how the cells can transition from fluid to solid in the embryo by changing their shape. I guess that's that's basically growth that's causing that. Um, no? Um, I think it's actually a change in the expression of adhesion molecules. The uh, cell adhesion molecules is our oh, and cortical actomyosin. So I actually think that's the nice thing is it's actually disconnected potentially from growth. Um, I could talk a lot about that, but yes. Okay, so um, I'll just go to what my question was going to be anyway. Uh, so uh, I think in your model, um, the energies are all assuming elastic constitutive behavior, aren't they? Kind of like springs between vertices or elastic boundaries. But what if the constitutive behavior was viscoelastic? So you had some kind of dissipation of the energy in time. Maybe they're you know, changing their preferred rest length through time through creep or something like that. Could that allow a transition between the fluid and the solid state, um, states more rapidly as a function of time perhaps? That's a great question. Um, so I'll answer it in two ways. The first thing I wanna highlight actually is that the spring-like nature is not in the individual edges here. And that's really interesting. So like actually um, our model sort of suggests actually that the um, edges are, are roughly viscous on the time scales we care about. The individual edges, because they have um, a term which is linear, this interfacial term here is linear in the perimeter, which is a surface tension like term. So it's actually inherently viscous is the assumption we're making. But we have this idea that there is a restoring force, like a second order term that comes in either because there really is a contractile ring that is elastic on some time scale or roughly elastic, but actually it can also come about from not having enough adhesion molecules because actually this second order term can come about from anything that really prevents the perimeter from increasing too much, right? And you can imagine that if you have a scarcity of adhesion molecules, that would do that, right? So there could be sort of, I guess I just wanna say first that although the model is sort of elastic in some sense, it doesn't require that the underlying constituent pieces be elastic. It's just saying the energy function is quadratic in those things, um, which can come about from lots of sort of second order processes that are not elastic per se. But your second point, which is really important, is, is that you can actually put in all of these fun perturbations to vertex models that say things like, well, actually, um, if I wanted this to really insist that this was a viscoelastic edge, um, I could say, well, actually, or maybe even it's stress thresholded because there are some molecules in biology that have stress thresholds, then actually I won't allow it to shrink until I reach a certain threshold of the stress. So there's a, a gorgeous paper actually with um, Shiladitya Banerjee as the theory author on it that explores those types of possibilities. And you do get different macroscopic behavior to the system. So your question is really astute because as soon as you change those things, you get new types of macroscopic behavior. That's exactly right. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's, it's, it sounds like a really cool and flexible model to play around with. So yeah. It sounds, it's a very fun playground. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver? So just to go back to your, your sort of perimeter free fluid solid boundary that you were showing a moment ago. Mm -hmm. is, is that recovered by your new theory, with, which looks at these uh, Hessians? Yes, it, it, it is. Um, because all of this, the only thing that this requires, basically, so this axis, this cell alignment axis, is basically, you can think about it as a strain parameter. So it actually turns out that like the theory that you write down that sort of makes sense with all this 
rigidity stuff I talked about at the end is, is that there's um, a first order term in the shape. And then there's something which has to be by symmetry quadratic in the strain. And when you write that down, that's why you, I mean, actually in the end it's very simple. That's why you get a parabola looking thing for this black line is, is that we're sort of combining strain. Like I talked about in those um, spring networks with a vertex model to get this result. But both of them together are still obey the second order rigidity thing that I talked about. They both, since both spring networks under strain and isotropic vertex models um, rigidify due to second order rigidity, anisotropic vertex models also rigidify due to second order rigidity. When you add the strain term to the vertex models. They do you have to make quite hard assumptions about the, the, the topology of your cells? Yeah, well, um, so that's a good question. Actually, it's a deep question. Um, for spring network models, you don't have to make any assumptions about the topology. For the vertex model so far, we've only investigated systems that have threefold coordinated verte vertices so that you have cellularized networks that are sort of generic. Um, Max Da Peng B has a recent paper where he explores what happens when you have rosettes or higher fold coordinated vertices. And then yes, there's some, um, I would articulate that actually his work, although he, he, cause he published that a year ago, suggests actually that there's a mix of first order rigidity for rosettes and second order rigidity for the underlying threefold coordinated networks together that are responsible for rigidity and non-generic vertex models. Thank you. Can, anybody else? Yeah, could I ask a question? Andrew? Yeah, thank you. That's a great talk. Um, I was thinking about two other models you might analyze. One is uh, membranes in cells. So you, if, it, if they're all lipids, they'd be solid. And, but then if you start to put in more and more cholesterol, they can go fluid. And the, they're all hydrocarbon. So you can model this in two dimensions. So the interaction energies between all the subunits is much the same. But it's more, you can maybe model it as just the shape. So the cholesterol would be, have a larger cross-sectional area than the lipid, whether you could model a system like that. That is an interesting question. So I can give you my off the cuff thought, which is that um, I think my understanding, I'm not an expert in membrane physics, but my understanding of that system is, is I think naively first order rigidity would account for most of that fine, because the idea is, is that it, it, you can, from, from talks I'm into, it seems that you can really sort of model sort of these systems roughly by excluded volume of the molecules themselves. But, but I will say there's some interesting, so, so I know this is what you asked, but I'm going to say, you know, in some things, there's things like spectrin that forms an elastic in some membranes, right? There's spectrin molecules that form more of a network within the membrane. And those might be a really interesting place to look for these types of features where the topology of that spectrum network might give you a meta material like behavior that sits on top of that first order rigidity behavior that I expect governs sort of just the lipid cholesterol mixture. Okay, thanks. And the other system I was wondering about is in 3D in proteins where you get, can go from having a, a molten globule hydrocarbon core going to, um, but it, it will fold properly. The hydrophobic core will go rigid and become like crystalline where you can model something like that. That is, that is also really interesting. So it's certainly something we have actually started to think about. Um, my entree into that field has been, there's actually been a lot of interesting work um, on basically looking at zero modes in allosteric proteins in particular, um, and whether these sort of first order, sort of first order rigidity zero modes could predict allosteric behavior. And so one of the things I was thinking of doing is looking at whether second order rigidity <laughs> could be important for allosteric behavior um, of that sort. Um, that's a little different from the question you ask. And the reason is because like, I really don't know <laughs> the answer to your question. Um, so I think it could potentially be used in proteins, um, but um, yeah, I don't know for the particular example you said whether that would make sense. Yeah, start with allosteric, it's easier. Yeah. Just like hemoglobin or something like that. 
Yeah, exactly. Because so far, actually, first order rigidity seems pretty good at some of them, but there's a few they just don't get at all. Um, and so maybe second order rigidity could really explain the analysteria and those things, maybe <laughs> if, if it, you know, if you get lucky. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, at least a probably naive question, you might have answered it, but to what extent the uh, you know, global boundary conditions and the, their topology will kind of influence the uh, kind of local behavior and, and minor curvature? So is it needs to be just particular beyond particular size or? That is not a naive question. That's a really good question. Um, so the first thing I can tell you is, is that the boundary conditions play a very critical role in the state of self-stress that is selected at the onset of rigidity in the system. So you can, you know, because I told you, you know, at the state, like in all of these systems, even the ones that are first order rigid, that become first order rigid, um, there are states of self-stress that appear at the rigidity transition. And it's actually really important. So you know how I emphasize that there was a difference between structural rigidity and energetic rigidity? And one of the reasons is because if you really emphasize that the energy functional is important, uh, then um, the state of self-stress that's selected by the dynamics driven by the energy functional or driven by the boundary conditions can be highly non-generic in, in a mathematical sense. And so the proofs for structural rigidity sort of rely on existence of states of self-stress. They say, oh, there exists a state of self-stress where second order rigidity implies first order rigidity. Okay, but what I'm telling you is the boundary conditions can select really exciting non-generic states of self-stress at the transition that can really change the sort of, that, that, are, that are basically where you would expect second order rigidity doesn't imply things anymore. And that could be very interesting for materials design. So the idea we have right now is by applying sort of special forces at the boundary of like a material, you could sort of lock it up and then unlock it, move it, and then lock it up again, just by applying sort of interesting boundary conditions to the system because of this feature. Could you engineer some kind of hysteretic behavior moving across these transitions? Yeah, well, that's exact. Well, yes. Well, we don't know, but yes, that's the that is the idea that we have. Yes, is that, and also you could um, use these zero energy modes that are possible to sort of globally, like sort of, it, it would be a very low energy. Like, so imagine you wanted to build a reconfigurable material at very low cost, like to deploy in space or something, or a nano robot or some other buzzword, <laughs> you know? So you'd wanna do that at very low energy. So the idea is, is if you could basically design a material so that there was a global configuration change, you could just apply a small force at the boundary and then basically make there be a zero mode, right? Like one of these energetic zero modes that doesn't exist in normal material, you know, in sort of generic materials, then you could change globally, change the shape of the whole thing. And then you could apply another force to lock it back in so it could support shear stresses again. That is totally conjecture, by the way, but it's things that are opened up by this new idea of how to think about the problem. 